How many of you here this morning have heard of Alexander the Great? A few of you. Um, he's one of the greatest rulers of ancient history. I don't know how much you guys have delved into his life, um, how much you had to study him as part of uh, world history. Uh, he had, by the age of 32, conquered most of the known world at the time. Some of you are getting close to 32, and you know I, I gotta ask, what have you done with your life? Right? Um, I'm way past 32, but uh, may, maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe you've heard of this story of the request that he made for his funeral. He he knew he was dying. He knew he was coming to the end of his life. Now keep in mind, this is you know at that time the greatest general, the greatest ruler, greatest man in known history at that time. And when he was dying, he asked, he said for his funeral, he would like his body to be transported in the coffin with his hand sticking out um, so, that, so that everybody can see that he leaves the world the way that he came into the world with his hands empty, with his hands holding nothing. And it's, it's really deep, it's really thought provoking. And apparently it's unsubstantiated and possibly made up that Alexander the Great asked for this. Um, there's a lot of things that, that would tell us that this didn't really happen, but for how somehow the story has been passed down through the ages and you see it um, on, on the internet. And it reminds me of one of Abraham Lincoln's most favorite quote, uh, famous quotes, which is, you can't believe everything you read on the internet, so take everything <laughs> with a grain of salt. But here, here's the thing. True or not, whether or not he said this, um, I think the sentiment resonates with us, right? I don't know if you've ever um, stopped to take stock of uh, what you have, your, your possessions. I, we, we heard recently, you know, one of us had to fill out renter's insurance and looking at all their possessions, they, they realized how much stuff we have. And, you know, here's the most powerful man with all that he has, all that he's accomplished. And supposedly he's realizing that at the end of his days, he's not going to be able to take any of it with him. Everything that he's amassed, he can't take it with him. But here's the thing, you know, that story, whether it's true or not, we don't know. But I have a better story we can look at, something that I know is true. It's from the Bible. So open your Bibles up and, and let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Um, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Now, I know some of you have ESV, some of you have NIV, some of you have NKJV. I'm going to read from the message version for fun a little bit. And also, it, it, it livens up the story a little. Follow along. I think it'll match pretty well with whatever version you have. Um, so Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone out of the crowd said, Teacher, talking to Jesus now, Teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. How many of you have uh, fought for family inheritance? I hope not. And I hope when the time comes that inheritance needs to be distributed, I hope we don't fight. I hope we just respect you know, our, our relatives, whatever. Anyways, so here's this man shouting at, t at Jesus, Teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. Jesus, he replied, Mr. What makes you think it's any of my business to be a judge or mediator for you? Then Jesus turns and he's speaking to the people. Jesus went on, take care, protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in all my grain and goods and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Dun, dun, dun. Just then God showed up and said, fool, tonight, you die, and you're born full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self, with a capital S, and not with God. That's the message version. Here's that last verse in New King James translation. 
chapter 12, verse 21. So is he who's la who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, I can see how maybe this passage and, and that last verse in particular might be a very nice verse to use uh, in a fundraiser, right? This is, you're going to die and, you know, you're a fool if you, you take care of yourself and you're not rich toward God. Now, here's the thing. You should be rich toward God. All of us should be. But that's not why the Lord laid this passage on my heart this week. Um, now, as we were reading, you might be thinking, you know, the story, it's just about a farmer. You know, who cares about farmers, right? They're no big deal. Look, um, did you know that in 1905, the University of California um, spun off a farming school? The, you know, be before there were all these different UCs, the main UC spun off a school just for farming in 1905, and it's now today the number 20 on Forbes' list of America's top colleges, UC Davis. So farming is a big deal. Farming feeds us, right? When you go home and you have food, um, we have a little farm behind this curtain. Uh, if you ever have a chance to see it, all, all our compost gets in there and strange things grow, and we harvest things from there. But Okay, anyways, here is a farmer. He's amassed great wealth, and he's put all of his confidence in his riches. The problem is, he ran into a problem. He had too much. He had too much. And so, so he makes these plans. He plans to build bigger barns to hold all the grain that he has. How many of you have ever run into this problem where you just have too much wealth? And, and it just becomes a problem. Right, just me? Okay, I guess no. Um, I, I don't have the problem. Now, the, this guy's problem, we, we start to see, this guy's problem isn't just about having too much. The problem wasn't even that he was making plans to be able to hold all the grain that he has. To you know, He's making adjustments to accommodate his increasing wealth. The problem, well, let me say this. For our family, for the Wu family, Penelope is not here, so God sent the birds this morning to cheer us on. For, for our family, for the Wu family, God has provided for us, and we've not been in want. In, in our experience in life, we've not been in want. Um, and yes, I, I know, I used to work as an engineer here in the Silicon Valley, but you know, one thing, one thing that I personally have always dreaded was that I would think I would think to myself, I've done well for myself. That was one thing that I was always very worried about, thinking that I've done well for myself. Because I was very aware, I was very aware of how easy it would be to think to myself, you know what, our family doesn't lack for anything. Uh, we're in relatively good health. Everything's on the right track. You know, kids are doing well. They're, they're going, getting through school and graduating each grade and eventually going to college. And I guess we haven't needed God very much. And some of you are looking at me like, oh, what some people believe that. Some people believe that as long as life is going smoothly, as long as everything's going well, then they haven't needed God very much. You know, my, my family doesn't lack for anything. We've been in good health. Things are going smoothly, but I understand it's only by God's grace. And I am scared that there may come a day where I think, God, I did this. I managed just fine without you. And, you know, God forbid that I would ever take credit for myself and disregard God's grace. You know, and you might say, Jason, you know, you're the one that showed up to work. Right? You're the one that put in the hours. You're the one that brought home the bacon, so to speak. So you should take some credit. You know, it's, um, well, what about all those late nights that you used to work as an engineer? And, then, and when I say late nights, I mean really late nights. There were times when um, our, our teammates over in India, they're running tests on the machines in the office, in the labs. And what happens when they run a test and things go haywire and they need to reset the machine? They are thousands of miles away. And so what happens then is everything comes to a halt and their workday is done. Unless someone goes to the lab and resets the machines because physically you got to be there to do this. And, you know, there were times when I happened to be up at all hours checking my work email. Don't do this, by the way. But, you know, I happened to check my work emails those few occasions 
they would send out an SOS, you know, the machine is bricked, please can someone reset it if anybody's awake. I would see the email and it's like, okay, here we go. Hop in my car, drive over to Menlo Park, you know, access the lab, turn it off, turn it back on, and they're good to go for the rest of the day. I would stay for another hour just to make sure it doesn't. Anyways, I could say, Jason, you put in your work. You, you, you've done your part and you've earned your share of what you've gained in this world. You've taken good care of your family. Doesn't that count for something? And, and I would say, you know what? No, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I had the good health to be able to stay up late. To be, I happened to be reading that email so I could respond to that need. I was able to go and do this work. I am thankful for every way that God has provided for us and taken care of us. And, and I'm thankful that I was awake at that hour to see the email. I understand. I understand God's hand is very much in my life. Now, what's my point here? I'm worried. I'm worried that I would take credit for myself and forget that all I have came from God. And if you come back to this parable that we just looked at, what Jesus said, it's interesting. In the message version, it, it begins with the farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. Uh, New King James, and I don't know what version you guys have, but in a New King James version, it says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And I thought it was interesting that as Jesus told this parable, he made sure to point out, he, I'm sure this man, maybe not himself, maybe the workers he hired, but I'm sure somebody put in the work to till the ground, to plant the seeds, to water, to pick out the weeds, to put insecticide. I don't know what they did. Somebody worked. But Jesus pointed out, what gave the increase? The ground. The ground did the work. How did the ground yield plenty? It was by God's grace. But here's this man. He, he's done what he should do. And as he celebrated his overflowing wealth, what do we see there? In, in, in his thinking to himself, not a single thought of God. Not a single acknowledgement of God if it wasn't for you. Because there are people who do all the work they can do. And the ground just doesn't produce soil. It doesn't produce fruit. Nothing comes of it. And so here's this man. He's celebrating all that he has. And he's disregarded God's part. In other words, he's saying, look. Look at all that I've done for myself. And, you know, I, I think this is a danger. That all of us, we take a certain confidence in what we've been able to achieve financially. It's, it's nice to feel some bit of financial security, is it not? But the danger is that we look at what we have, we know that we can put food on the table, we know we have a roof over our heads, and we start to take credit for that, and we start to kind of forget what part God played in it. And then slowly, slowly, our possessions and our wealth become our God. You know, I... I, I remember this unfortunate situation at another church from years ago. Ellis and I were just talking about this a, a few weeks ago. Um, there was a, a, an investment opportunity offered um, and it, we, we found out later that it was a scam. But there were these two gentlemen in a church, well, one gentleman in a church and his partner who was not at the church. Anyways, they, they came and, and spoke to the church leaders and said, you know, you see all the stocks booming. Here we have a, a company, it's just taken off, and here's an investment opportunity. And um, some of the leaders of the church were kind enough to go around to church members saying, do you want uh, some place to invest your money? It's quick money growth, you know. We, we heard promises of, what, if you can put in $20,000, we can turn it into a million. And I thought, Gosh, if only we had $20,000, you know? <laughs> Sorry, we, we don't have that kind of money lying around. But like I said, it turned out to be a scam. Um, the, the people who set up the scam, they, they fled the church. And there was a lot of bad blood between people at church, you know? And people were angry that they were taken for a ride. And we were saved from the situation because we were too poor to invest anything. But there's this constant undercurrent of, where is the next opportunity? Where can I get more? Where can I take what I have 
and make more and do more and it's always this question of more more where can we find more not that we shouldn't work with uh, work hard and be wise with what god has given us i'm not saying you know take your money out of your investment accounts and hide it under your mattress don't do that we have to be smart with what we have but if we're constantly looking for more and more and more there comes a point where we that takes over our lives and when we look at what we have we start to take confidence in that and we start to say to ourselves soul you have many goods laid up for many years take your ease eat drink and be merry just like this farmer we looked at and and then and then here is the scariest part even with all that we have even with all that we have it's still not going to be enough even with all that we have it's still not going to be enough which Paul warns Timothy about Paul warns Timothy about and as this morning we're going to be looking at the last chapter in 1st Timothy and you can turn there first if you want but as, as we start as we continue reading this second to last letter to Timothy in the beginning of this chapter we see Paul he's warning Timothy again about these teachers remember these teachers who are teaching doctrines that are contrary to the word of god they were adding on to the doctrine the gospel of jesus christ they were putting things in that should not be in the teaching they were leading people astray and paul in his warning to timothy about these false teachers he actually calls out a particular trait about them that timothy needs to watch out for so if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, go a little bit into the verse, and this is what Paul says. He says, these are people who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Let me read that to you again. These people, these false teachers, they are those who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So not only were these guys, these teachers, not only were they teaching false doctrine and wrong doctrine, they were doing it for the purpose of monetary gain. They were doing it to make money. It was their, for, for lack of a better phrase, it was their get, ri get rich quick theme. theme. And, and so these teachers, these teachers are going to teach and they're going to preach what's popular. They're going to teach and preach what people want to hear. And they're going to teach and preach whatever is going to garner the largest following. And that's why the Lord Jesus says, my way is narrow way. The world's going to offer you the broader way. It's an easy way. And that's what these teachers are teaching. The easy way. You can do something for yourself for salvation. And... And the, they may even preach, the more you give, the more you'll be blessed. And then they sit back and watch the, the, the tithes and offerings roll in. And Paul says to Timothy, do not, do not pervert the word of God for your own selfish gain. Because God is not mocked. God is not mocked. Look, here's the thing. You want to get something out of serving the Lord? You want to get something out of... Um, being faithful. Here's a secret. Look at verses 6 to 8. This is what Paul writes. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to gain something from this? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we, this sounds familiar now, right? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these we shall be content. Now, I don't know how many of you are, are still tracking with, with this sermon. Um, maybe you're thinking, this is just for pastors, right? Because Paul's writing to Timothy, a, a full-time servant of the Lord. Um, and this is one of those motivational speeches for pastors who are about to step into full-time ministry. Like it, you, You've seen coaches in boxing rings, right? Standing behind their guy and... and rubbing their shoulders you can do this champ you can do this I believe in you you can do this you, you're about to go into a ministry where you're not going to pay a whole lot but you can take it you can take it right listen to what Paul says here 
godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't worry about the low salary you're going to have as a pastor. That's not what this passage is about. It's not just uh, an encouragement for pastors to be content with low pay. This, this word of God is a help to all of us. Because if, if, you, if you look at your life, I, I think you'll see all of us are plagued to some degree with always wanting more. Do you, do you feel that in your life sometimes? That you're always wanting more. It's never enough. Whatever you have is never enough. And it's, it's the antithesis of what God wants for us. Because what, what does God want? God wants us to be satisfied, does he not? But how does he want us to be satisfied? He wants us to be satisfied in him. God is our all in all. He said this in his word. He desires for us to find our all our satisfaction in him. And wanting more goes against what God desires for us. Because here's the thing. When you set your eyes, when you set your eyes on finding your satisfaction from getting more of anything in this world, right? If your target of satisfaction is to get more of anything in this world, it could be money, it could be fame, it could be, should I go here? It's kind of trite. Um, social media, likes, followers, whatever. Um, it could be it could be affection from your friends and th anything anything in this world that you're desiring to have more of if i could just have a little more of this then i would be satisfied i'm sorry to tell you you are going to be disappointed not because you won't get more you will you're going to pursue these things and you will and you can get more and when you get that next little bit more that you thought was going to fill your heart you will be satisfied for a short bit of time. I'm speaking from personal experience. And then very quickly, you've experienced this too, I think. Very quickly, that little bit more, it wears off, right? That little, that little bit of a high that you get from getting more, it wears off and all of a sudden, you need more. And then you need more. I mean, this, you, you think I'm making this up. This is actually something that happens in our bodies. I forget, what's, what's the name of the chemical? Do you remember? Dopamine. Do dopamine. So our body releases a chemical in our brain, dopamine, and it's, it's, it makes us feel good. And these little hits of dopamine come when you have some kind of external stimulus. And what happens is as, as you get more of whatever is kicking in that dopamine release, you get a little bit and you feel good and you get a little bit, you, get, you feel good, and scientists have found what happens to your brain as you get that hit, and another hit, another hit of dopamine, is it starts to numb. The receptors that receive pleasure from dopamine start to numb because it starts to get accustomed to dopamine, and then you start needing more dopamine to be released. But in order to get more dopamine, you can't just have the same stimulus, you gotta have more. So. If you, I, I'm, I'm just going to use the social media thing because it's easy to use numbers. If you get five likes on a post, ding, ding, and you feel good. The next time, five is not going to be enough because your body gets used to what it got and so you're always, always wanting more. Before anybody had found out anything about dopamines and, and the pleasure centers in our brain, God already knew that if you're looking for satisfaction from things in this world, you'll never be able to get it because your body gets used to it and you're gonna need more, you're gonna need more, you're going to need more. Also, the world is finite in what it can give. There comes a point where what the world can give you to satisfy you, it plateaus. And then you hit that point where you can't get that increase anymore and then you're stuck and then you start to feel terrible and that's where we see these spirals where people are getting more and more and they're happy for a short while, but they cannot remain satisfied because the world cannot give you enough. But, but if you set out 
to find your satisfaction by coming to Jesus. If you set out to, if you understand right from the get go, the only thing that can fulfill my longing is Jesus. And you're thinking, of course, Jason has to say that because, you know, he's a pastor. But look, the world is finite, Jesus is infinite. Jesus is the source of all things. He created it was the world was made through him. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. If you really need to be satisfied, the only way is to come to the source of all things, and that is Jesus. And he will never run out. You will never get tired of Jesus. The problem is we get lazy with pursuing Jesus. We get distracted and we start wanting to again accumulate more and more thinking that that's going to satisfy us and we forget to come to the only one who can completely satisfy us and that is Jesus. You know when when we set ourselves to wanting more of Jesus when we make that when we purpose ourselves when we make that decision when we choose to quiet ourselves from this never ending rat race that the world throws us into and to say, you know what, I'm going to take a step back. Yes, I know I have to go to work tomorrow morning. There are things I need to do. I need to work to earn a paycheck to pay my bills. Yes, I get all of that. But with all of these things going around and happening constantly, I'm going to choose to take a step back and I'm going to quiet myself down and I'm going to come before Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. And I need you to fulfill me before I put myself back into this rat race. Jesus, be my satisfaction so that I don't try to just get my needs met by this world. When we do that, when we quiet ourselves down, when we learn to seek his face, that's what is going to fill our souls. That is what's going to satisfy us and this morning this morning before we take the bread and cup this morning i was wondering i wanted to ask brother peter to come up and i, I was wondering if we could sing that last song one more time before the lord's supper just the first verse in the chorus and and as as peter leads us to sing perhaps you know he can lead us also into a time of prayer to ask the lord to ask the lord to show you in your own life in your own life, what are the little trophies of life that you are still chasing after? Is it a better paycheck? Are you chasing a retirement fund? Are you chasing affections from your friends, from your family? What is it that you are chasing to fill your heart? These little trophies that you want to put in your life. Ask the Lord to show you those little things that you're chasing after, whatever it is that you think will finally give you the ultimate satisfaction. Ask the Lord to show you those things. And as we, as we worship the Lord, as we sing, as we pray, I encourage you, bring those little trinkets. Bring those little trinkets before the Lord and say, here, Lord, have these things because I understand they're not going to satisfy me. Trinkets, I call them trinkets. You know, this week I, I went through a personal belongings box that I've had since high school, junior high. You, you'd be surprised by the things that I thought was precious to me that I've held on to over the years. I look at it now and I laugh, but at the time I thought this is the most meaningful thing in the world to me. Same thing now at my age, there's gonna come a day when I look back at the things I treasure now and I'm gonna say, Jason, you fool. These things don't mean anything. This morning, come before the Lord. Bring the little trinkets that you're chasing after in your life and say, Lord, I give this to you. Be the only one that can satisfy me. Knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater thing. Peter, let us sing and maybe let us pray. And let the Lord deal with your heart this morning.